are so excited and blessed to have a very special speaker with us today. This is a woman of God that has preached here many times. She preaches the word with passion and excitement and enthusiasm. And she happens to be my little sister today. So, you know, buckle up. Turn to your neighbor and say, buckle up. Say, buckle up. Will you join me in welcoming my little sister, Miss Keela? Show, come on up here, sis. Come bring the war, baby sis. Come on with it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. What do you say? Oh, awesome. I'm so excited to be here today. <laughs> oh. You know, I have preached from this pulpit several times, but I've never had an entire Sunday morning to myself, so this is really exciting. Who knows what could happen? I mean, some of you probably have never heard me preach before, and so I don't, not sure why I told you to buckle up, but who knows what could happen? I mean, crazy things could go on here today. No, I'm just kidding. I'm so excited and so honored. You know, I'm nervous. I think people are like, oh, do you ever get nervous? Yeah, I get nervous. I'm nervous to be up here. And um, I'm excited. And it, it's humbling. Like, it's, it's really humbling that to be in a position where God would bless me with the word that he feels like you need to hear. That's, that's significant to me. And I consider that a great privilege and an honor. And I don't take that for granted, that, that what God has placed on my heart, I know, is that, is that some of you need to hear, and I hope that and pray that your hearts are open and that God speaks to you today um, in a new way and, and maybe in a way that you've never heard or experienced before. It's going to be an awesome time um, to hear from God, and I'm super excited. If you'll stand, we're going to read, um, we're going to open our Bibles to Malachi chapter 4, um, and we'll stand for just a few minutes while I read this portion of Scripture before we get into God's Word. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Keela. That's all there is to know. I don't really know what else to tell you. That's me. I'm Keela. I'm his sister. I'm the guy who is singing's wife. I've been here for a really long time. A really long time. Like, a really long time. My whole, yeah, my whole life. Yeah. Which is a long time to be in one place. <laughs> oh, I feel like it is. You didn't grow up in my house. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm blessed and honored by God to have this privilege to stand before you today, to live the life that I live. God is good and God is faithful and his word is true. And I'm passionate about his word and what he wants to speak to our lives and us hearing from him today. My prayer has been more than anything. What I have to say does not matter. <laughs> what I have to say today doesn't matter. It's what he has to say. And I, I simply desire more than anything to just be the vessel through which God speaks today. So Malachi chapter 4, the last two verses of the Old Testament read like this. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you that your word is alive and active, that it has no point of irre irrelevance in our lives, that there will never come a day or a moment or a time when this word doesn't have something to say to us. So I pray today, Lord God, that you would speak to our hearts. God, that um, what you desire to say to us would be powerful, meaningful, and challenging. Congregation, if you could just place your hand over your heart. I pray that every heart in this room would be open today, God that every wall would be broken down, every hard ground, every hard soil would be, um, would be tilled right now in the name of Jesus, that we would be in a place to receive your word today, God. Now place your hands over your ears. God, let our ears be open, that as you speak, Father, your word would penetrate all of the distractions and all of the noise around us, and that it would go directly to our heart and to our soul, God, that today our, we would be challenged to live differently, to live above God, to live beyond. In the name of Jesus, amen. You can have a seat. If you have your Bible still open to Malachi, I want you to hold that one little page after Malachi. There's probably one little blank page right there between the end of Malachi and the beginning of Matthew. If you have your Bible open, I want you to hold that one little page. Today, I wanna to speak to you about this one little page in the Bible. This is a significant 
page in the Bible. There's probably not any words on yours. Maybe it says New Testament. Maybe there's, if you have a study Bible, there's maybe a little section in there about the Old and the New Testament in that transition period. I want to speak to you today about that tiny little significant page in your Bible. See, because that page represents 400 years. 400 years lapsed between the conclusion of Malachi where we just read and where Matthew takes place. 400 years, that one little page represents 400 years. 400 years of silence. Today I wanna to talk to you about what do you do in the silences of life? In the moments when you're expecting God to speak and God is not speaking. In the moments when you are needing to hear from God and all you get is silence. When you've walked through a tragic situation and you stand on the other side of it and you go, why God, why me? And you get no answer. When you're standing at a place trying to figure out what your next step should be and you're saying, God, I need direction. God, I need guidance. God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? And you get nothing. Today, I wanna to talk to you about the silences of life. What do you do in the silences of life? So those um, 400 years, some pretty significant things happened. I wanna outline some of the things that took place in those 400 years, just to set the stage for where we're going. So the Old Testament happens, God speaks through prophets, the Israelites come into the promised land, all of these things happen, the prophets are speaking, and then all of a sudden there's silence, and there's these 400 years, this 400 year gap. Here are some things that happened in that 400 years. As is the history of the Israelite people that we read in the Old Testament, they just get conquered and handed over from one, one nation to another. All these different nations come in and they, they, and they ravage and they pillage and they take over the Israelites. They take over, they take them into captivity. And the Israelites are basically just handed from one nation to the other, one captivity to the next captivity. Captivity, captivity, captivity. The, nation, the Israelites are just getting traded around. Now, as all of this is happening, each of these new um, people that are taking over the Israelites are forcing their culture onto the Israelite culture. They're forcing them to, to act a certain way, to eat a certain way, to, to behave a certain way. They're bringing in their own idols. They're bringing in their own um, attitudes of worship, their own beliefs about God. And the Israelites are kind of caught in this moral crisis, this, this spiritual crisis of who are we going to be? What are we going to do? All of these nations are coming in and telling us how to live. How exactly are we going to live? That's where the Israelites find themselves in this 400 years. Well, some of the Israelites were like, okay, yeah, we'll live like the Romans. We'll live like the Greeks. We'll live like the Persians. It's fine. Whoever it is, we'll just live like this. And those Israelites were called lib liberals or Hellenists, or maybe the word that you're more familiar with is Sadducees. That's where the Sadducees came from, is in this 400 years of silence, they just kind of melted and, and merged into whatever culture was coming in. They said less about and less about following the Pentateuch, less about following God's word, and more about just living how we want to live and how it kind of works with the nation that's in charge of us or whoever our king is. We'll just make it work. But then there was another group of Israelites that said, absolutely not. We will not conform to the culture around us. We will hold true to the rituals and the, and the traditions of the word. We will sacrifice as we've been told to sacrifice. And we will give as we've been told to give. And we will worship as we've been told to worship. In fact, some of them were so held so strictly to their rituals and their beliefs that those rituals became their God. It became less about serving God and more about following the traditions and the rituals that, that they'd been raised in. That group of people was called the Pharisees. That's what you would know them as, the Pharisees. They're the ones that Jesus said, they honor me with their lips. They know the scripture, they know what's right. They honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. All of that was happening in this, this 400 years of silence. During this time, um, many of the kings who were coming over the Israelites we're realizing how much power the priests held over the decisions that the common people were making. If the priests said to do it, then the people would do it. 
And if the priest said not to do it, then the people wouldn't do it. So, so these different kings and emperors, they would remove the priests, they would remove the Le- Levitical priests from the temple, and they would hire priests to go in and to lead the people. They would have paid priests serving in the temple so that they could sway the people to do what they wanted them to do. So fast forward to 63 BC. This is the final, um, final group of people who came and took over Jerusalem and, and the Israelite nation. It's the Roman Empire. This is where we find ourselves at the beginning of the New Testament. The Roman Empire has established rulership over the Israelite nation. And um, they loved the Greek culture. The Romans loved the, the Greek culture. So, so here, these Israelites have been flooded with all these different cultural varieties. And now the Romans come in and they want them to live as Greeks. So then we enter into where we're going to go today, um, into the Greek culture where the New Testament was all written in Greek. In fact, because the Greek culture inundated the, um, it inundated the Israelites so greatly, it impacted their lives so greatly that all of the New Testament authors wrote the New Testament in Greek. So we're gonna fast forward to Luke chapter one, and we're gonna look at the moment in time that broke the silence of these 400 years. The significant 400 years of silence is all broken in this first narrative that takes place in Luke chapter 1. I was so excited um, with Pastor Josh's message last week. If you, didn't, if you weren't here, you missed a great word. It was so awesome. But I loved it because it ties so closely into what I have to say today. And I love when that happens. It's like he just kind of lobbed it up for me to spike at home, and I'm really excited. All right. So Luke chapter one, I feel like I need a comedic break here. Sorry, I don't have one. (laughs) I'm just really excited. It's like this. So when I, when I knew I was going to preach this summer, which has been several months, I've just kind of been like praying and waiting and, and every once in a while I would feel like, okay, here's, here's a word. And I have this little note page in my phone where I just keep all these random notes of sermons and things like messages, whatever. I don't even know what they are. Just things, just things. They're just things. And so I'm like, oh, what am I going to preach? What am I going to preach? And then this word began to build up in my heart, kind of out of nowhere. And just like, it was just like confirmation after confirmation after confirmation. So then a couple weeks ago when Pastor Chad was here, God really started to build more into this, you know, and I was just like, it was like confirmation. This is what God wants me to say. So I had written my message and then Pastor Josh spoke last week and it was like confirmation again. So literally last Sunday after he was done, I was just like ready to like, word vomit all over everyone, this message that God had put inside of me. Like literally, it's just like, I, I don't know how to explain it. It's literally like a bubble inside of you that's just ready to burst and you just wanna pop it and go Bleh! There you go, happy day, congratulations. I don't know what, yeah, that's how I feel. So sometimes when that happens, I talk really fast and I apologize if that happens. You can go to YouTube and watch it on slow-mo if you miss something. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know, Lisa can slow that down maybe because I talk fast when I get excited. And I'm excited, (laughs) if if you didn't know. All right, so Luke chapter one, we're gonna start in verse five. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah. Now, interestingly enough, Zechariah was not a priest who had been removed when the Roman Empire took over. He was a priest who was in line, he was in the Levitical line of priests and was actually serving in his, in his lineage, okay? So we have Zechariah, he's um, a priest, right? And he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren and both were advanced in years. So Zechariah and Elizabeth, Zechariah is a a priest. He's serving as in his lineage and God identifies that they are both righteous. This is so interesting to me. 400 years have passed where there was not a person righteous enough to be written about in God's word. 400 years, and I'm not saying that the people in that time were just lawless and none of them were righteous. I'm sure that there were righteous people in that time, but none of them were doing anything significant enough for it to be recorded in God's word. 
400 years where there was not a prophet receiving divine inspiration from God to speak into the lives of his people significantly enough to be recorded in scripture. I'm not saying God wasn't speaking. I think God's always speaking. I'm saying there was probably a lot of people who had their ears shut off. There were probably a lot of people who just were not listening. So here we are, 400 years, nothing, and then boom, into the scene walks Zechariah and Elizabeth who walked blamelessly and were found to be righteous. Which is also interesting to consider the fact that they never knew Moses. They never met David. No great prophet, Isaiah, Jeremiah, all of them, Obadiah, Jonah, none of them. That was all 400 years before Zechariah and Elizabeth were even a part of God's plan. 400 years that they miraculously found themselves in a place of righteousness, essentially without leadership. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is probably later on in my notes, but I'll go ahead and just say it now because it seems to fit. Sometimes we rely way too heavily on a man or woman of God to lead us into righteousness. There will be people, mark my words, there will be people who will stand before the judgment seat of God and God will say, depart from me, I never knew you. And those people will walk away and go, a lot of good my pastor did me. Let it not be you. May that not be said of you. Because guess whose responsibility your relationship with God is? Yours. Yours. It's on you, baby. It's all on you. It's all on you. So here we find Zachariah and Elizabeth, 400 years, no one speaking, no godly leadership in their life, yet somehow God identifies that they are blameless and righteous before him. You want to know why? It's because they honored God with their hearts and their actions. It was not lip service for them. It was not lip service for them. They were not people who lived the rituals, who did the traditions for the sake of doing the rituals and the traditions. They were people who honored God with their lips and with their actions. So we're going to talk about some things that happened, some decisions that Zechariah made that led him to this place, to be the man that when God broke silence, it was with him. You know, my senior year of high school was like a great year and an awful year all at the same time. Some of you were here my senior year, and you may not even, I don't know, realize this, or you might remember it pretty significantly. But I was at this weird place, and probably most seniors are, and I have so much more grace now towards them having been there myself, where I didn't know what life was going to look like after high school. I didn't really have a really concrete plan. I had dreams. I had ideas. I had things that I thought I wanted to happen. And um, so I just kind of set out on this journey of pursuing my dreams. And it was like every door that I went through, I was like, oh, there's my dream. Let's walk through that door. And as soon as I'd get to the door, it'd slam in my face. Oh, okay. Well, I'll turn. Oh, there's a, maybe another way I can get around that to get in that door. No, slam in my face. Literally, it was like everything I wanted to happen, everything that I wanted to happen, that was good. Like, I wouldn't want bad things to happen. I wasn't, like, wishing for bad things. I was wanting good, what I thought were good and godly things. I wanted to go to Bible college and all of these things that were, in my perspective, good. That's what I wanted to happen. And God was just, like, slamming door in my face, door in my face, door in my face. And I would spend, I would spend countless t services at the altar just crying, just weeping before God, saying, God, give me direction. God, tell me what you want for my life. And all I heard was silence. There was nothing. I was not hearing, no, Keila, I'm leading you to do X, Y, Z for this purpose. Nothing. I was, God was silent in my life. Or what I 
perceived to be silence in my life. I wasn't hearing what I wanted to hear. He wasn't answering as I wanted him to answer. I was like, okay, God, if you want to close that door, that's fine. Close the door, but tell me why, and then tell me what the alternative is, because I feel like I'm getting boxed into this little tiny corner that I'm never going to be able to get out of, and God wasn't answering. I've learned now, you know, there's that screw. <laughs> There's that scripture that says um, the steps of the righteous are ordered by God. And I literally felt like I wasn't stepping. I was just like fumbling. I was like just rolling through this like, oh, God, and ending up where, oh, okay. Guess this is where we're going, you know. I've learned now that God sometimes, for me anyway, doesn't give me so many steps ahead because I'm probably going to rush it and make it work how I think it needs to work. I kind of tend to be controlling like that. Um, hallelujah, my husband loves that about me. No. Um, but God just wasn't, he was wanting me to trust him. He just wanted me to trust him. So he would just give me a little inch at a time and a little inch at a time and a little inch at a time until I finally ended up where he wanted me to be. Now, if you said to me, you know, I have a great career, I have a wonderful family. I love, my life is great right now. My life is great. Will this be my life forever? No. What will my life look like outside of this? I don't know. I don't know. What do you want to be when you grow up? I don't know. Well, I have dreams and I have aspirations. I have things and visions that I feel like God's put in my heart. And I so badly just want to slam through some walls and make those things come to life. But I've learned if I just wait on God, he's going to take care of it for me. It's all going to be good if I just take it one day, one step at a time. So in the silences of life, here's what we need to do. Let's go back to um, Zechariah's story here. We're going to take off in verse 8. Here's what Zechariah was doing in those 400 years of silence. While he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, the first thing that we find Zechariah doing, fulfilling his obligation in service to God. People, beautiful people who I love. Zechariah had never heard a prophet speak. No, no man of God said to him, Zechariah, you need to be in church every Sunday. You need to be in church every Sunday. You're a priest. You need to serve God faithfully. He just did it because it was the right thing to do. Sometimes doing things out of routine is the right reason to do them. Sometimes coming to church because it's what you know to do is the right reason to come to church. 32 years here. Almost, almost 32 years I've been at this place, and I can promise you there have been plenty of times I didn't want to be here, that this is not what I wanted to do. But I remain faithful to God, and he has blessed me abundantly. Zechariah and Elizabeth were faithful to God, and he counted it as righteousness in their lives because even though it wasn't what they wanted to do, it's what they were doing. Sometimes you have to pay your tithes even when you don't want to pay your tithes because it's the right thing to do. Sometimes you have to stand up and worship God even when you don't want to because it's the right thing to do. And sometimes doing things out of routine is the right reason to do them. We find ourselves so often in this place where we're walking through a crisis or a tragedy and we want that crisis or tragedy to give us excuse to make wrong choices. And it doesn't. Right is still right when life is wrong. And wrong is still wrong when life is wrong. When you are walking through an awful situation, sin is still sin. Tragedy and crisis do not give us permission to make wrong choices. In fact, I would argue that when we make wrong choices in the midst of a tragedy, the cost is greater. It's more costly to make a wrong choice in the midst of a crisis or a tragedy. Let me give you an example of this. When I've had a bad day at work, it does not give me permission to treat my family disrespectfully or to be short with my husband. Have I done those things? Yes, and I'm sorry. 
but it's not an excuse. Having a bad week is not an excuse to treat other people who don't know Jesus disrespectfully. You are a Christian in every situation and your witness matters. Your witness matters. Walking through tragedy does not give us permission to make wrong choices. I find, I feel like sometimes we find ourselves at this precipice of, will I serve God or will I not serve God? Will I continue to come to church or will I not continue to come to church? Which one is it going to be? Let me make it really clear for you. Serving God or serving the enemy, the cost is the same. The cost is the same. It will cost you everything. Serving God or serving the enemy, the cost is the same. It will cost you everything. The difference is what you get for what you paid. The difference is the product you get for the price that you paid. Serving God will cost you everything. It will absolutely, we just sang it, I surrender all. God will ask everything of you. Serving the enemy will cost you everything. Some of you have been there. You know it will cost you time. It will cost you money. It will cost you relationships. It will cost you character. It will cost you everything. The difference is what you get for the price you paid. Serving God you get a life of joy, peace, direction, and an eternity in heaven. Serving the enemy, you get a life of pain and misery and an eternity in hell. For me, the choice is easy. Some people, the choice isn't so simple. But serving God, serving the enemy, the cost is the same. Everything. The difference is what you get for the price that you paid. So serve Jesus. God asks everything of you. God, as a gentleman, stands before you and says, I want to take everything. Not because I'm mean, not because I'm, I'm hateful, not because I don't trust you, but I want to take it so that I can make it right and then give it back to you and you can live more fully in it. And the enemy says, I don't care if you want to give it to me or not, I'm going to take it because you're my slave now. So serve God faithfully. Like Zechariah, in the midst of the silences of your life, in the midst of asking questions like, why God, why me, why now? Serve God faithfully. Be faithful to your service. Be faithful to the obligation and to the service of God. Continuing with um, Zechariah's story, we're going to move to verse number 9 here. So we've, we've discovered that he's serving as a priest. He's on duty, and um, it's his line, it's his it's his turn to be serving as priest in the temple. So um, verse 9, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. This place that we're in, so first, Zechariah was fulfilling his obligation. Second, Zechariah was spending time in God's house. You cannot forsake this. You cannot walk out on this. This is community. This is life. You cannot forsake this. Trust me. I remember it was a Sunday morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, when I woke up having um, severe abdominal cramps. It was in February, February 6th. I had just told my family um, in December that um, we were pregnant with our first child, and um, so February 6th, about 3 o'clock in the morning, I wake up and I have just severe abdominal cramping, and I just start bleeding. I just start bleeding profusely, and um, so I wake Dylan up, and, and I was like, you know, we need to go to the hospital. I'm, I'm having a lot of pain. I'm bleeding, um, so we go to the hospital, and I find out I find out that um, it was a Sunday morning. It was a Super Sunday. Um, it was a Super Bowl Sunday, and we called our parents, and my parents came to the hospital in their football jerseys because <laughs> it was Super Sunday, you know, that whole tradition. Came to the hospital in their um, football jerseys, and they, and they were with us, and we found out that I had, that I had miscarried our first child. And um, so you know, I took the week off of work, and we went home. My parents, you know, my mom was kind of like struggling. She's like, I don't know if I should go home with you or go to church. She's like, I really feel like I need to be at church. And I said, yeah, you're fine. Go to church. We'll be fine. 
So Dylan and I went home, and um, Wednesday came, and um, Dylan went to church early and, you know, was working and getting stuff ready for service that night, and then it was time for me to leave for church, and I, I remember having this moment, like, I don't want to be at church at all. I just have walked through the hardest moment of my life. Like, this is, this is tragic, and this is, I feel, I feel lost, and I feel empty, and I don't want to be at church. I didn't want people to come up and hug me and tell me how sorry they were or their condolences. I didn't want, I just wanted to be alone. I didn't want to be here. I was asking God why, and God was not answering. If any, I felt like, God, if anybody doesn't deserve to walk through this, it's me. Like, I don't understand, God. Why are you punishing me like this? Why have I had to go through this tragic situation? And God was silent. I didn't hear from God. God wasn't answering me like I felt like I needed to be answered. And I didn't want to be here. This isn't where I wanted to be. Um, but Dylan was <laughs> a pushy husband and made me come. No, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But he, he did. He strongly encouraged me. He's like, no, I really think you need to come. And I know it's not what you want, but life has to go on. And we have to figure this out. And eventually you're going to have to face this. Eventually people are going to have to see that you're hurting and broken. And eventually you're going to have to just be vulnerable to people. So I came to church that Wednesday night and... Um, you know, we were in worship, and and we were just singing, and a group of girls from, from high school came, Taylor, and some girls from our, our youth group just came and, and stood around me and, and put their arms around me and prayed for me and just uplifted me. And that was a significant moment in my life where maybe God wasn't speaking to me directly, but God was using people in the midst of my tragedy to reach me, to remind me that he was present, that he was faithful and that he had a plan. Sometimes when we're walking through difficult situations, sometimes when we feel like nothing but silence from, the, from heaven, we have to be here. You, you have to be here. You cannot, you can't forsake this. This is a part of, this is now a part of your life. This is now a part of who you are. And when you walk out on this, you walk out on us. You walk out on family. I don't think, I don't think everyone understands the depth of the bond that you have that you are now a part of this, is you are family. And you wouldn't walk out on family when they're in a tragic situation. And you would want your family to be there for you in the midst of a tragic situation. So be here, be present. I said it, for 32 years I've come to this place and I haven't always wanted to. I haven't always wanted to, but one day, and this is not a joke, one day I literally put a piece of duct tape on the ground and I stood behind that piece of duct tape and I said, I'm making a choice and I'm making a declaration if I'm gonna serve God forever. And if I step over this line, I've drawn a line in the sand. And if I step over this line, I am in it for the long haul. And I stepped over the line. <laughs> so here I am for the long haul. No turning back. Sometimes I've gotten really close to that line and looked back and went, man, I'm not sure I wanted to make that choice, but I made that choice and I held on to it. I held tight to it. Can I tell you, if your house was facing north, that's north. If your house was facing north and every day for 90 days, you, wrote it, you rotated your house one degree to the west, for 90 days, it would be centimeters rotating from this direction, one degree, one degree. You would rotate your house by centimeters. But do you know that if you did that every day for 90 days, that in 90 days, your house would no longer be a north facing house, your house would face west. Sometimes, We're serving Jesus, and we make one degree turn the other direction and go, it's no big deal. I'm serving Jesus. I committed to this thing, but you know what? I don't feel like going to church today, so I'm just going to rotate. I'm just, it's just one degree. Jesus is still the focus. He's still right there. I'm still completely facing his direction. 
but it's just one degree. And then the next day comes and you have a really bad day at work and you're like, oh, I'm just going to take all my frustrations out on other people and treat people unkindly and disrespectfully. God is still the focus. I'm still facing north. I'm still facing north. That's still the direction I'm heading. In no time at all, you'll be facing a completely different direction by one tiny little change, one tiny little change. You know, what's interesting about that is if you were miles away, if you were one mile away from a house and you watched that house and then the next day you looked and that house had rotated one degree, on the house's perspective, from where the house sat, it would just be a few centimeters. But from several miles away, it would be feet. It would be yards. It's interesting that it's so much easier to see little tiny subtle changes when, you're, when you have a distant perspective. So when your pastor walks into your life and says, I've noticed you've made just the, the slightest change. I don't think it's significant, but I've noticed that your attitude is off just a little bit. I've noticed that you haven't been as faithful just a, just a couple of weeks. And you, and you want to say to your pastor in your spirit of defensiveness, oh, it's no big deal. I've had, a rough, I've had a rough summer or work's been really busy or this or that or excuse X, Y, Z. And your pastor is, is saying, I'm, I've got a distant perspective from your situation. And I recognize you've only made a little bit of drift. You've only drifted just a little, but that drift is significant from where I'm standing. Because I've watched this pattern develop in other people's lives. I've watched other people make the choices that you're making. And I can promise you in a year from now, if you continue on the path that you're going, you're going to be facing a completely different direction from where you want. I sat down with a young lady one time who I had recognized was making some drift in her life. And uh, <laughs> she had come into this relationship and um, with this young man and so I was just kind of feeling it out, and I'm asking her all these, the hard questions about this relationship, and she's like, no, he's a good guy. I'm like, okay, does he serve Jesus? Well, no. Does he go to church? No, but he's a good guy. He's a really good guy. I'm like, okay, well, he doesn't serve Jesus, so seems pretty obvious to me that good guy or not, it's probably not the guy for you. He's not serving Jesus. Oh, it's, it's really not a big deal. He's a good guy. So we meet a couple of weeks later. I'm like, how's it going? Good, really good. Things are good. You still seeing that guy? Yeah, yeah. You guys have been intimate? Yeah, yeah. But he's a really good guy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sin has entered into your relationship. This is no longer God's will for your life. Point blank. It's no longer God's will for your life. And she looked at me and she said, why would God have brought him into my life? if he didn't want me to have a relationship with him. <laughs> I said, God didn't bring him into your life. <laughs> but that's pretty obvious to me. I said, Why, what makes you think God brought him into your life and the enemy didn't? To me, to me, it's the enemy's plan that's being fulfilled in your life right now, not God's. So to me, that bait wasn't God's, that bait was the enemy's. And she was like, well, why would the enemy bring me such a great guy? He's such a good guy. Why would the enemy bring him to me if he's such a great guy? Because you're not an idiot. Because if the enemy brought you a loser, you would know it was the enemy. You fell for his tricks. You fell for his tricks. You were facing this direction, and you made one tiny little compromise. Just one itty bitty one. It wasn't even, honestly, it wasn't even a bad idea. It wasn't even a sin for you to sit down and have dinner with that guy. No harm, no foul. But you made one little compromise that made making the next little compromise a whole lot easier. A whole lot easier because you made the first compromise. Because you drifted just a little bit. Ask me if she's serving Jesus. No. Ask me if she's still in the relationship with that guy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. And ask me now if she thinks it's right or wrong. She thinks it's right. She thinks it's right. She thinks it's right. She thinks that, that God can just excuse the choices that she's making, the sinful choice, the sinful lifestyle that she's living in. God's just going to excuse it because she's drifted so far out of perspective. 
listen, in the silences of life, we've got to be faithful. We've got to remain faithful to God's house. We've got to remain faithful to the obligation to serve in God's house. So we see Zechariah, he's, he's serving, he's um, in the temple of the Lord, and he's burning incense. This is so interesting. So when a priest, um, they cast lots, right? And, and, and um, Zechariah was chosen by the lot to um, burn incense during this week that the Bible is recording in history, right? This was a significant moment in Zechariah's life because when you were chosen by the lot to um, burn incense, it only happened one time. There were lots of priests, so the chances that you were even going to be chosen were really, really slim. But once you were chosen, you could only do it one time. This was literally a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity in Zechariah's life. It was so significant that God was moving Zechariah into this position to be able to speak into his life. It was literally, literally changing things in Zechariah's life so that he could speak into his life. I've got to pick up the pace here because I'm gonna, I've got... Oh some things that I want to say. But I just want to say what was so significant about burning incense, it was Zechariah bringing before God the prayers of the people, right? That's what incense was. It represented all of the prayers of all the people who couldn't come and stand before God, right? Um, Zechariah was a priest, so the incense altar was directly in front of the veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. So Zechariah is here in this moment burning incense on the behalf of other people. We read earlier that Zechariah and his wife were barren. Do you want to bet that Zechariah hadn't multiple times went to a priest and said, hey, I need you to pray that my wife and I will have a child? It's the only desire of our hearts that we could bear a child. Will you pray for us? And how many times incense was burned on Zechariah's behalf? How many times different priests burned incense in Zechariah's pursuit of getting an answered prayer? And now here is Zechariah in the silence. God had not answered his prayers. He was an old man. He was giving up on that dream. God hadn't answered that prayer. And here he is. He's burning incense on the behalf of other people. It's so easy for us when we're walking through a silent or difficult situation to just forget everybody else around us. To get so focused on our tragedy and our situation, our crisis, that we completely lose perspective that there are other people around us who are hurting. That there are other people around us who are walking through their own tragedy. And frankly, there are other people around us whose situation is probably a little bit worse than ours. I want to challenge you in the silences of life to consider the needs of other people. Number four, verse 12, Zechariah lost expectation and anticipation of the voice of God. I'm not going to read the scripture because I got to, I want to pick up the pace here. Um, but Zechariah, here he is, he's burning this incense and all of a sudden an angel of the Lord appears. And Zechariah is straight up freaked out scared. He's troubled. He's thinking, what in the world is going on? Zechariah lost anticipation. 400 years. You want to bet Zechariah didn't know about Moses? He didn't know about Moses at the burning bush? You want to bet he didn't hear about um, the donkey that spoke or, or the, the times that Abraham encountered angels of God? And here was Zechariah. For 400 years, no one was talking. And he probably just thought, I bet that sort of thing just doesn't happen anymore. I bet that's just not the way life's going to be anymore. Major prophets aren't going to come and speak into our lives anymore. And he lost anticipation of God's voice. God wants to speak to you. Do you know that? I think sometimes we, we are so quick to discount the fact that God wants to speak to our lives. God paid a high price for your ear. We always talk about the blood of Jesus and how it brought redemption from sin and it brings healing. But the blood of Jesus paved the way for us to, be, to experience the presence of God. The blood of Jesus paved the way, and we can't take for granted that God wants to speak to each and every one of us. I am, I am by no means a special person. There is nothing special about me that makes God have more desire to speak to my life than yours. He wants to speak to you where you're at, in the midst of your situation. But we are so often blaming ourselves, giving up on the fact that God could speak to us directly, that we don't even listen for him to speak at all. We don't even listen for him to speak at all. We, we place the responsibility for God speaking into our lives on other people. On other people. You know, it was in September of 2002 that, that Pastor Dylan and I had our first date. 
it was homecoming at his high school, and he had asked me to go to homecoming. And so my mom drove, drove me to his house, and we took some pictures, and um, Dylan cooked dinner. He cooked dinner for us. He made chicken parmesan and fettuccine alfredo, and it was the first time I've ever had vanilla Coke. I remember that. And um, we, had, we, had a, we had a great, great date. But um, he, did, he did all the work. He did all the work. His mom didn't do it. His mom didn't do it. And in fact, if we would have sat down and, and if I would have walked in and, you know, his mom was buttoning his shirt and shaving his face and tying his tie, putting gel in his hair. I mean, he was a 16-year-old hunk of burn and love. <laughs> um, oh, so where were we at? <laughs> He was a 16-year-old young man, and if I had walked in and his mom was taking care of all of that, I would have been a little thrown off. And if we would have sat down and he would have said, look at this wonderful meal that my mom prepared for us, it would have been weird. And if his mom had been standing in the corner going, ask her what her favorite color is, be nice, say please and thank you, it would have been weird because the responsibility for creating the atmosphere for that date was on us. It was on us. Now, his parents provided the dwelling place. His parents provided the utensils. His parents probably provided the money. But the responsibility for the foundation of our relationship being laid was on us. It was our job to get to know one another. It was our job to set the course for our relationship. It wasn't the homeowner's position. It wasn't their job. Our relationship was our responsibility. So often we come into these kind of environments and we expect someone else to have heard from God on our behalf. We expect someone else to create the atmosphere for God's presence to feel welcome. We, we expect someone else to tell us whether or not we're experiencing God. No, guess what? The responsibility for that is on you. It's on you. You know, if you walked out of a service and you said, well, that was a waste of my time. I just didn't, I just didn't hear from God. I just didn't, God just didn't even speak. That was just a waste of everybody's time. Guess whose fault that is? Guess whose fault that is? Because God is more than free with himself. God is more than open to come into this room and to speak into our hearts and to our lives. But it's our responsibility to, to receive. It's our responsibility to experience. It's not, our, it's not the pastor's job to force feed us God's word. It's our responsibility to receive it. I'm going to skip a few of these things because I got to get to where we're going. There's so much more to say, but let's get to the meat of this, all right? Where Zechariah was at, that 400 years of silence, is exactly where we find ourselves today. God has put a period on the end of Scripture. The end of Revelation has been written, and it is done. And now we find ourselves in another period of silence, where God is not speaking through major prophets, We're not having major encounters with angels. Scripture is not being added to. It's done. And we are in a period of silence. Much like Zechariah, we are surrounded. We are captives to the culture around us. We're in cultural captivity, having to decide what are we going to do? What kind of Christians are we going to be? And God is setting the stage for something very significant to happen in this world much like he did at the end of the Old Testament. See, we read back there in Malachi chapter 4, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes, and he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And this is what the angel, see, in this moment of Zechariah's life where the silence is broken, this is what the angel says to Zechariah is going to happen. He says he's going to give birth to a son, and you will name him John. 
and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord. He must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go before them in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the lust, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. See, John the Baptist was the fulfillment of, the prof- of that prophecy at the end of Malachi. Literally, the two, the two moments in time at the end of the Old Testament and this beginning of the New Testament merged together where John the Baptist is the fulfillment of this prophecy. So Zechariah had this moment of silence, and the angel has spoken to him. And here we are, us, where Zechariah was at. God is not speaking. Essentially, we're in a period of silence. And God's spirit is roaming to and fro across the earth, looking for someone who will prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. See, that's what John the Baptist was for. That's why this moment was so significant, because John the Baptist was the one who would come to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. And here we are in this silence, and God is looking for someone to prepare the way for the coming of the Lord. Part of the challenge we face is that we are a society of cultural Christians. We are, a, we are a group of people whose relationship with God is contingent on whatever we can get our hands on. Our Bibles, our phones, um, sitting in services like this, the right music, the right worship pastor, the right lights, the right setting, the right atmosphere. I want to ask you today, if you were uprooted, teleported to the other side of the world where you didn't have a phone, you didn't have Wi-Fi, you didn't have Christian radio, you didn't have your pastor, it was just you. What would happen to your relationship with God? What would happen to your relationship with God if the only word in your life was the word that you had hidden in your heart? How quickly would you starve to death spiritually? If all you had, this was all gone, all this, these temporary things, and all you had was your relationship with God, what would happen to it? My husband and I <laughs> spent a week apart. He was at camp this week, and I was at home this week, and um, frankly, we haven't really had a real conversation since he's been home. He came home to me working a 24-hour shift. Yesterday was a busy day. We got up this morning, headed to church. We really haven't had, like, a real conversation in about a week. We've talked, we've texted, like, yeah. But those things, spending quality time together, it's important, but spending quality time together, talking, texting, this ring on my finger, those are just cultural enhancements of a commitment that goes much deeper, of a commitment that exists apart from those things. So I ask you, if your relationship with God was contingent on the things that you're, the enhancements in your life, what would happen? What would happen? See, it's because of the silences of life if the worship team wants to come. It's in the silences of life where those enhancements fall so short. It's where the depth and the substance is really put to the test. In the silences of life, when, when we're seeking and when we're asking and we're not hearing and doors are being shut in our face, you know, some of you in here have prayed for things for a very long time. Like Zachariah and Elizabeth, there have been burdens in your heart, things in your life that you have prayed and cried out for you've wanted God to do on your behalf and the answers just have not come can I tell you remain faithful remain faithful if God never speaks again can I promise you if God never speaks again we have everything we need to be the men and women of God that he's called us to be if he never speaks again we have everything we need 
for us to be able to stand before him and him to count us righteous and blameless. Everything we need right here. And what God is looking for is a man and a woman of God who will prepare the way for the coming of the Son. You know, John the Baptist was a weird, weird guy. Weird. He wore, he wore camel's hair. Um, you know, I just read, he was held to the Nazarite tradition, just like, just like Samson that we talked about last week. The stories, the parallels between Samson and John's life are remarkable. Both of their parents were barren. God spoke to both of their fathers by an angel to tell them to foretell of the birth of these children and called both of them from birth to live a Nazarite life, that they would be filled with the spirit from birth, that they were not to cut their hair, to drink wine or strong drink. They were not to touch anything dead. Exact same situation between John the Baptist and Samson. But there's a significant difference in what happened in John's life and what happened in Samson's life. And the difference is that John's commitment to be a Nazarite, his commitment to separation, his commitment to living different was not just lip service, it was his heart. It was in John's heart. Samson, the reason Samson ended up where he ended up was because he was all action and no heart. His heart was not committed to be the man of God that he was called to be. And John lived out his commitment in his heart first, and then it proceeded through to his actions. And John was weird, straight up strange, dressed in camel's hair, ate bugs and honey, lived out in the wilderness away from people. And you know what? He made an impact on the lives around him. He did exactly what was foretold. He turned the hearts of the people back to their father and he prepared the way for the coming of the Lord. I would ask you that today, no matter what situation you find yourself in, could you choose to live separated enough that you would make a difference in the lives of people around you? That you would be one, that God would say that one That one's preparing the way for the coming of the son because he still has to come back. There is still a son coming and God is just looking, where are the way makers? Where are the, where are the ones who are, who are laying out the trail that I'm going to send my son back on? Where are the ones who are going to turn the hearts of the people back to the father? We get so easily caught up in, in relevance gospel, that we have to be relevant and and we need to look like the world but not act like the world and then people will find Jesus. No, no. Let's be people who can live separate enough by our hearts, by our hearts that we could turn people back to the Father. I'll ask that you would all um, stand with me We're going to move into a a time of prayer. I've said a lot today. (laughs) Sorry. Um, Jesus. I am not for staying the same. Like, I think if God takes the time to speak to me, it's because he has something he wants me to hear and something he wants me to do. So I'm, I'm not about God just speaking for me to go, oh, that felt good, or oh, that was really nice to hear, or I want to be challenged, I want to be pushed, I want to constantly be improving. When I drift, <laughs> when I drift, I want my drift to be towards excellence. I want my drift to be towards improving. You can drift one way or the other. I want my drift to be closer to Jesus. So so today, my prayer is is not that the word was inspirational, only inspirational, but that it was challenging. 
and that you, that you find your hearts challenged today and challenged significantly enough that you choose to respond. Bow your heads with me in prayer. God is saying right now that there are people right now that he has been desiring to have an encounter with you. That you sit here and you say, God, why have you not spoken to me? And he would say, I've been waiting. I've been ready and I've been waiting, but you continue to brush me off. You continue to rush what I have to say. You continue to rush your experience with me. And I can't speak in that environment. There are people in this room and there have been angels. Jesus. There have literally been angels dispatched from heaven to come and to speak into your life in the midst of your tragic situation. But you have been too quick to turn away. Jesus. There have been some of you in this room that God has desired to do significant things with your life. But you've been so comfortable in the routine just accepting it as it is. But you are failing to let yourselves be challenged to let God speak to you. Jesus. 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 Oh, church, if I could draw it out for you, I cannot create this moment for you. It's not my responsibility. I cannot create an encounter for you. All I can do is lay the groundwork. All I can do is create the invitation. But I promise you, I promise you, that if your hearts are, are willing and ready, God will meet you here today. God will speak to you where you are, in the midst of your tragedy, in the midst of the silences, in the midst of the confusion and the chaos. God will speak direct and we, he will speak clear if your hearts will be open. God, I hesitate because I feel like the risk is so great. <laughs> that God, if we would turn our ears from you one more time, that you would stop speaking again. God, today, let us not reject your word. Let us not reject your voice as you speak to us today, God. But Lord, with openness, without fear, without hindrance, God, but in total openness, Lord, would we come up before you, Lord, and let you speak into our hearts, into our lives. God, nothing else matters in this moment. Nothing else matters in this moment except you and what you desire to say to your people. So God, we choose to submit ourselves to your will. Have your way in this moment. Have your way in the lives of your people, God. That you would speak to us and that as you speak, God, we would listen and obey and move forth to change the lives of people around us. The invitation is simple. If you wanna hear from God, come. Come. If you want God to speak into your life, come. Come. Just be open. 
whatever God wants to do, whatever God wants to say, it might sound different than you expect. It might come in a different way than you expect. But just be open 